Hello, welcome everyone to tonight's Preservation School, Bowery 400 Years on the Bowery. Um, this is our first class for the winter. Thank you so much for joining us. We have uh, two other scheduled and we will have one in February as well. We have challenges in cellar and basement in uh, basement use in New York City on January 25th. And we have New York City urban planning on January 26th. You can find all the information along with all of our other programming on our website, hdc.org. Uh, all of our previous preservation schools are all on our website as well as our YouTube channel. You can check those out as well as plenty of other walking tours and uh, our Bronx Preservation Commission or sorry, not mission, um, uh, Bronx Preservation videos. So please also check those out. And if you wanna sign up for any of our emails, you, you can do that on our website as well. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me, Michelle. I'm at M-A-R-B as in boy, U-L-U -U, at hdc.org. And with that, we will start tonight's presentation. Um, if So Bowery was one of our Six to Celebrate groups. Uh, so David, if you could start off talking about how Bowery became a Six to Celebrate and how Bowery Alliance of Neighbors got started doing preservation, researching the Bowery and how you came to be a Six to Celebrate. Thank you, uh, Michelle. and. Uh... Thank you to HDC for inviting us. Um, hold on, I wanna make sure I got this on. Um, um, just for starters, uh, the Bowery is New York City's oldest uh, thoroughfare. And uh, it was originally a Native American trail. Then it was a Dutch farm road. The word Bowery comes from the Dutch word for farm. Uh, the street goes from uh, Chatham Square to Cooper Square, and originally it went all the way to Union Square, and actually convergence point of Bowery and Broadway, uh, which in the uh, uh, 1800s for some time were the two most important streets in the city, and that's where the term Union Square comes from. Um, and uh, the street was New York City's first entertainment district. Uh, it's where tap dance, vaudeville, Yiddish theater, Stephen Foster and Irving Berlin. Uh, in modern times, uh, it's where modern tattooing began uh, and abstract expressionism, beat literature, uh, improvisational jazz and punk rock all have their beginnings. was formed in 2007 in reaction to out-of-scale development. In particular, a 22-story hotel, the Cooper Square Hotel, went up on Cooper Square and really shocked everybody because as you can see in this picture, uh, there's no building anywhere near that tall in that area. Um, and not long after that, uh, a federal era building that was one of the oldest buildings in New York City on Cooper Square, uh, 35 Cooper Square, uh, was uh, not accepted as uh, a potential landmark and uh, the building owner tore the building down. And that was something that really sent shock waves through the community. Our organization, Bowery Alliance of Neighbors, as well as uh, HDC and uh, Village Preservation all tried more than one time to get the building landmarked. Um, another uh, uh, thing that really was shocking to us was when the Germania Fire Insurance Building, which we successfully got landmarked, uh, suddenly a tall tower went up behind the building, which 
uh, was pretty disturbing. And it not only destroyed the uh, historical context of uh, the Bowery side of the building, but this is what it looks like on East 4th Street. You've got this entrance gate that looks like something you might see out of a third world country. Um, further down the Bowery, uh, you have other developments like this. Uh, this building, the Wyndham Garden Hotel, when it went up, it looks absolutely nothing like any of its surroundings. It's, it's out of scale, out of context, and the construction of the building caused uh, the, the forced demolition of two adjacent buildings, one on Hester Street and one on Bowery, and 60 uh, low-income, uh, mostly Asian-American residents were displaced. Uh, and at the time, some of us thought, you know, it looks like a monster, and then somebody realized that uh, indeed it, it looks like the killing machine in one of the Star Wars films. Um, in the same area, just a couple of doors south, there was another building that had a mass uh, eviction uh, that was a cause to live uh, for some time back in 2018. And uh, these, these tenants did get uh, back in the building, but uh, this this kind of overdevelopment and the impact on community, not just the physical character, but also the people that live there is uh, something that's really uh, disturbed us. And this is a little spoof uh, repro of an old 1950s science fiction poster that we put together showing uh, the uh, overdevelopment of the Bowery as though it's uh, invaders uh, from another planet. Um, so because of this overdevelopment and the uh, severe risk, especially to the east side of the Bowery, uh, we worked with uh, a very beloved uh, community activist and zoning maven that uh, you know many of you are very familiar with, Doris Dether who created the East Bowery Preservation Plan. Uh, it was widely praised. We got support letters from uh, all the uh, major community elected officials, organizations, businesses on the Bowery, uh, but unfortunately city planning uh, rejected the plan, uh, which was very frustrating for us. We were able to get several important buildings on the Bowery uh, designated as individual New York City landmarks. Uh, we, uh, of course, uh, worked with HDC on all of these. Um, and here's a few examples of ones that we were able to get landmarked. Um, and uh, working with the Two Bridges Neighborhood Council, the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors hired a incredible architectural historian, Kerry Culhane, uh, in uh, putting together a building by building research of the Bowery, which was submitted to the state and national register and successfully uh, got a listing on the state and national register of historic places. Um, if you visit our website, or you could also just look it up individually on Google, uh, Carrie's uh, research on the Bowery is absolutely incredible and has just been invaluable to us. It would be a pity if the Bowery got bulldozed out of existence. The National Register designation suggests the country agrees. Shouldn't the city do the same? The great New York City historian Mike Wallace in a letter to city planning. Um, so as a follow-up to the designation of the Bowery to the National Register of Historic Places, uh, we created a historic signage project, uh, which we call Windows on the Bowery. Uh, and uh, uh, 
and it looks at the incredible history of the street and in uh, putting together the research, we started out with about 15 or 20 sites that we wanted to make historic signage posters of. Uh, originally, we were gonna try to get uh, plaques on walls or plaques on uh, lamp posts on the street. And it was decided that if we were, you know, uh, if we worked hard and we did outreach to the community, we might be able to get businesses to display some of our historic signage posters. Uh, we had a committee of about seven or eight people that worked together to decide which pieces uh, were perhaps the most important or people would have the most interest in. And these included being as full connected to the Bowery, uh, important architecture on the street, events that have been connected to the Bowery, like the uh, Astor Place riot, um, and also achievements uh, associated with the Bowery, including, as I mentioned earlier, things like uh, the beginnings of tap dance, vaudeville, Yiddish theater, Stephen Foster and Irving Berlin, the first two great songwriters in the country, uh, starting on the Bowery and, uh, and punk rock and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, when the project first launched in 2016, we had uh, all 64 of the posters displayed on the Western windows of Cooper Union's uh, foundation building, which was significant because Cooper Union uh, was uh, the uh, pro bono uh, source of the graphic design of the posters. Um, and this exhibition in the windows of Cooper Union, uh, that was up for about six months. Another exhibition inside the landmark uh, Citizen Savings Bank which today is uh, HS, uh, uh, HSBC Bank. Uh, they have an exhibition, a uh, smaller exhibition inside the bank itself, and it's been there ever since. And that's Catherine Ng, uh, the manager. Uh, there's some of the Bowery business people, uh, business owners on the street that have allowed us to display our posters in shop windows. Um, this is Mindy Lang on the left. She's the art director of the project at uh, uh, Cooper Union. And Lenny Sloan, who wrote some of the pieces. Mitchell Grubler, uh, who wrote many of the pieces and also came up with the, uh, the very good uh, title for the project, Windows on the Bowery. And Tom Clem, who was a important advisor to uh, the project. Um, there were so many people that reached out to us uh, saying, oh, can we get a poster? Uh, or um, why don't you make this into a book that eventually we did make the uh, windows on the Bowery historic signage posters into a book. Uh, and that came out last year. And these are some of the people that uh, were helpful to us in this endeavor uh, and just incredible writers and researchers and uh, uh, the uh, funding for the project was La Vida Feliz, Puffin Foundation and Victorian Society of New York as well as contributions from Bowery friends and neighbors. Uh, Karen Lowe did the uh, Chinese translation, which uh, if you would like to get the Chinese translation, just, just contact us. Uh, information about the book uh, you can get on our website. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to go through some of the pieces in the book. Uh, which of course are based on the posters. Um, and this is an in, 
an amazing image that we ran across of the one mile marker that at one time was outside 214 to 216 Bowery. At one time, there were mile markers every mile going from south uh, at uh, what at that time was the downtown part of New York City, all the way up uh, to uh, Harlem. And this is the general piece that Kerry Culhane wrote, uh, giving the general overview of the Bowery and its significance. This is a piece uh, about uh, the history of transportation on the Bowery, including the uh, uh, what at the time was considered one of the most beautiful entryways to any bridge in the country, the Manhattan Bridge Plaza. Um, at 18 Bowery, the oldest brick house in New York City, uh, and this is where uh, young Itzy Berlin uh, went with Chuck Connors, who was like a local, uh, you know, folklorically famous uh, figure who led walking tours of the Bowery in Chinatown. He took Izzy down the street and got him a job as a singing waiter. And that's when Irving Berlin started writing some of his songs. Berlin was the first great songwriter in the country. And the, I have misplaced the slide, but uh, literally within just uh, two blocks from 18, is also where last residence of the first great songwriter Stephen Foster, uh, where he lived. At 50 Bowery, uh, the buildings are no longer there. This is where the Bull's Head Tavern was. This uh, most famously is where George Washington and his troops stopped for refreshments uh, to celebrate the uh, British evacuation of New York City uh, before, after they rested uh, marching down uh, to New York City uh, for the bigger celebration. Um, the uh, Bull's Head Tavern was later torn down um, and, and it actually uh, for uh, many decades was owned by Heinrich Astor, the uh, first of the Astor family to come to the United States. Uh, Heinrich Astor and his brother John Jacob were early uh, Bowery real estate barons. And of course, Astor Place uh, uh, is uh, named for the family as well. Um, the Atlantic Garden went up at 50 Bowery later, and this was a very important uh, German beer hall. It was known as one of the few places, drinking places, in the city where you could actually take your family. Um, and uh, some of the interesting uh, uh, things about the street are uh, recounted in the poster. Um, and this is the time period, uh, uh, the Atlantic Garden, when uh, a good stretch of the Bowery and the Lower East Side was known as Klein Deutschland. It was Little Germany. And this building here, uh, which is included in the book Forgotten New York, is the, a grand uh, open air glass ceilinged uh, uh, entertainment venue that was called the German Winter Garden. Later, it was uh, also known as the, uh, uh, the Windsor Theater after the Winter Garden was torn down. Uh, the, uh, when the, the Windsor Theater uh, had 3,500 seats and was the uh, largest theater in New York City for some time. Um, the book includes uh, several rare pictures of the Bowery, including this shot of the Dry Dock Savings Bank which is where the Bowery uh, Hotel is today. Uh, and these buildings are, are still there. 
Uh, this is the Germania Fire Insurance Building, which we helped get landmarked. And as you can see in this picture, as I pointed out earlier, um, high rise developments are destroying the historic sense of place in many of these uh, spots. Aha, uh, so this is uh, what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, in addition to uh, Irving Berlin's uh, connection to uh, Bowery and Pell Street, you've got Stephen Foster uh, who lived just a little bit further north on the Bowery at uh, the New England Hotel. This is where he died with a dollar in his pocket. Uh, first two great songwriters in the country. There's a piece in the book about uh, the gateway to old Chinatown, which goes into uh, the early uh, Chinatown and uh, uh, touches on the history of the Chinese Exclusion Act and uh, the Chinatown area was a prominent part of the Bowery and one of the important elevated trains stopped right here at the conjunction of Bowery and Doyer Street. And uh, tours that people would take of the Bowery always included Chinatown. When you look at old pamphlets, it was always Chinatown and the Bowery and people loved coming here. Um, the birthplace of modern tattooing was on the Bowery and Chatham Square. Um, this is a piece that uh, uh, Eric Ferrara, uh, the founder of the uh, Lower East Side History Project, did about the Bowery Boys. And it includes uh, a, a really fascinating look at how the, uh, the term Bowery Boys has uh, changed many, many times since the early 1800s. Originally, it was a uh, firefighting gang uh, that uh, was uh, reputed to, you know, do a lot of street brawling and, and so forth. And then later you've got uh, the Bowery Boys, uh, flashy dressers, and, uh, and then in the movies you had the Bowery Boys that were a roughneck gang. And uh, today you've got the uh, firefighters uh, on... Uh, yeah, at Great Jones, uh, and they take the moniker of the Bowery Boys. Uh, Martin Scorsese, who made a movie, Gangs of New York, uh, uh, which is about the Bowery Boys as well as other gangs, uh, uh, said this pretty incredible uh, statement about the Bowery being an inspiration uh, for his becoming a storyteller. Um, one of the most entertaining and fascinating pieces, if I had to choose one uh, that might be my personal favorite, it would be the, uh, uh, the piece about the Bowery Theater. This is where uh, Master Juba, William Henry uh, Lane, uh, attracted thousands of people uh, to this new dance known as tap dance, which Charles Dickens thought was uh, the most <laughs> thing he saw in New York City uh, on his visit. But the Bowery Theater is also where uh, T.D. Rice performed Jump Jim Crow, which uh, helped lead to the whole institution of minstrelsy, which of course uh, uh, channeled negative stereotypes of blacks and the term Jim Crow itself uh, of course, was later taken uh, uh, as the name for the uh, segregation uh, laws and statutes that were in states all over the United States. But the theater, the theater has so many other things as well. Charles, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Walt Whitman said that he was fascinated by the place. He loved the fact that uh, shop. Uh, shopkeepers, uh, tradesmen would be seated next to U.S. presidents, and he loved the ferocious way that the working class would clap in the theater. Um, this is where uh, 
the first uh, performance of ballet was performed in the United States and uh, many other things. Um, the vaudeville hook, if you were a bad performer uh, and they wanted to pull you off uh, stage, uh, this is where the idea of having a hook to do that was born. And uh, one of the great pleasures of this Windows on the Bowery project is the fact that we have uh, run into a number of uh, descendants of uh, some of these uh, figures that are celebrated in, in these uh, posters. And this is Harry Miner's grandson, Henry Miner, who called up one day because uh, somebody told him about the project. Um, Yiddish theater's first American home was on the Bowery at several very large uh, theaters. That's Jacob Adler, whose uh, daughter Stella Adler is famously uh, uh, the popularizer of method acting in the United States. She was Marlon Brando's teacher. Um, and as we went through all these these different pieces that uh, we were creating uh, about uh, the history of the Bowery. One of the things that's that's been common is just the layer upon layer of fascinating history. Um, so at 138 Bowery, uh, this building here, um, the Gaiety Dime Museum. Dime Museums usually had a theater and different exhibits, some of them kind of bogus, uh, scientific, uh, and you could see plays or uh, music, magic acts, and all kinds of things. So that happened here. And then also at the turn of the century, this is where Antonio Moreri uh, started uh, the beginnings of Italian theater in America. Um, that's W.C. Fields' granddaughter, Dr. Harriet Fields, uh, who visited the exhibition at Cooper Union and then walked the Bowery to see one of uh, the four places where W.C. Fields uh, had performed very early in his career when he was a juggler. Um, this is uh, a fascinating piece about the uh, uh, beginnings of the first baseball club in the United States, uh, which was based at the Gotham Inn. You see the building here. And then later, it was uh, a dime museum after that building was torn down. And the building that housed the dime museum where Harry Houdini made his first solo appearance is still standing today. Uh, Sidewalks of New York, uh, which is uh, one of the great songs about New York City was first performed at this theater, the London Theater, which was later torn down. And that's actually where the new museum is today. Um, a building that does still stand at 105 Bowery is where Oni Gagan's boxing saloon was located. On two floors, they had boxing rings where men is, and also women uh, would box. Uh, and uh, Adam Woodward, whose uh, private collection of Bowery memorabilia uh, was loaned to us uh, for this project. Adam uh, tracked down this poster uh, from Oni Gagans, which shows, you can't see it, I'm sure, on your computers, but uh, John L. Sullivan uh, performed here or boxed here very early in his career. The Astor Place Riot uh, is uh, abs absolutely uh, just screaming for somebody to make into a film. Uh, and the origins of it were, uh, among other things, class conflict uh, and the uh, uh, rivalry between a British actor and a nativist uh, American actor. Um, and it was for a long time, the bloodiest riot 
in New York City history. Uh, this is a piece about the emergence of gay nightlife uh, in New York City. The book Gay New York, uh, the first chapter is about the Bowery. And uh, um, this little building here is where uh, this Columbia Hall, which became known as Parisis Hall, was located. And they would have drag performers. And uh, uh, in, in the book, Gay New York, the author says that the Bowery was one of the few places in the 1800s where gays could go and express themselves openly without fear of reprisals. Uh, another rather uh, 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 frightening piece in, in the book is McGurk's Suicide Hall, which was a dive bar that was located at 295 Bowery. And uh, apparently a couple of young uh, prostitutes who, you know, were tired of their wretched, exploited lives went uh, they made a pact, they went to McGurk's, uh, and their plan was to get very drunk and then take carbolic acid and kill themselves. One of them did die, the other one uh, survived, and it got so much notoriety that other young prostitutes came to McGurk's and also uh, committed suicide by taking carbolic acid um, just an incredible story. Uh, and uh, Kate Millett, the feminist, uh, later lived in this building, and she recognized uh, this as an important story. Saved and wanted to turn a, a part of it into a museum that would uh, look at the lives of these uh, young women and working class women uh, of that time. Unfortunately, the building was uh, torn down. Uh, another favorite in the book is 134, 136 Bowery, which has an extraordinary history. They are, these are two of the oldest federal era buildings in New York City. Uh, they have a very significant uh, uh, and uh, uh, long lasting uh, 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 activity against slavery. There was an abolitionist press that was located there. Uh, uh, the Delaplaine family that owned the buildings uh, lived there for a very long time. Um, the, the 134 Bowery, it's of course two buildings. The one that's on the, the more southerly uh, position. Later, it became uh, one of the first YMCA uh, shelters uh, in New York City, and it also had a chapel that was located there. And as was so much in this story, in uh, more uh, recent uh, times, uh, in the 1960s, uh, the uh, sculptor painter Ava Hess uh, lived at 134 as well. Um, there, there's uh, another amazing thing that was brought to our attention about the time we were doing this project. Uh, we found out that John Brown's body was prepared for burial on the Bowery. Uh, he'd been executed in, uh, in Northern Virginia. And uh, his wife was accompanying the body uh, to New York State, where he was from. And uh, she felt like, uh, because it was such a long journey, they needed to get the body embalmed. But none of the towns would let her get off the train because John Brown was, you know, such a lightning rod fig figure. And so uh, Brown's wife had some of his uh, supporters uh, sneak the body into New York City under cover of darkness, and his body was prepared for burial. It was briefly displayed by those for those in the know, and then uh, transported further up to its uh, burial place uh, upstate. 
um, a civil rights pioneer who is about to have a statue uh, uh, dedicated to her achievements uh, near Grand Central is Elizabeth Jennings. Uh, Jennings uh, uh, was almost 100 years before Rosa Parks, uh, a uh, woman that refused to submit to segregation on uh, streetcars in New York City. And uh, she was very rough, roughly handled. She was thrown off the train as it went from Chatham Street up to the Bowery. And uh, she uh, very boldly took a, a legal case uh, against uh, the perpetrators, won the case, and uh, in 1855, uh, segregation on uh, New York City public transportation was ended. And uh, Elizabeth Jennings also has on Chatham Street, which uh, was once part of the Bowery and today is Park Row, there's an Elizabeth Jennings place that's there. Cooper Union, of course, is on the Bowery. The upper Cooper Square part of the Bowery uh, is where uh, a, a lot of amazing uh, uh, speakers were heard. Lincoln's uh, famous anti-slavery speech that propelled him into the White House was at Cooper Union's Great Hall. Frederick Douglass uh, made anti-slavery speeches at uh, the Great Hall and just any number of people. And uh, Along with Lincoln's speech, probably Clara Limlick's uh, famous speech uh, uh, to an assemblage of uh, shirtwaist workers led to the uprising of 20,000, uh, which uh, was in uh, 1911. The oldest continuously operating hotel is at 146, 148 uh, Bowery on the corner of Broom Street. And uh, Big Tim Sullivan lived there. And uh, this was a place where a lot of famous boxers would hang out. Uh, Boss Tweed, uh, as well as uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, would stop in there. Uh, Tim Sullivan lived at the uh, Occidental Hotel we're just looking at, uh, but he had his clubhouse at 207 Bowery and uh, Sullivan was a huge figure. Uh, he's credited by uh, historians as having one of the first multicultural uh, constituencies where, uh, um, and he also, uh, uh, he also was able to uh, uh, get through the Sullivan Law which of course it makes it against the law to have a concealed weapon. And that's of course still with us. He was, uh, Sullivan was the, known as the king of the Bowery. And uh, the queen of the Bowery was Maisie Phillips Gordon, uh, who uh, worked at a movie theater that was uh, right at the base of Bowery uh, at Chatham Square. And she was, famous for giving candy and lollipops to kids that would come up to her window. And then when she got off work, she would often uh, give money and, uh, you know, aid to some of the down and out on the Bowery. Uh, this is uh, one of New York's, uh, one of uh, the uh, Bowery's uh, New York City landmarks, the Bowery Savings Bank, which was designed by Stanford White. And this is uh, Hector Dominguez, uh, who is the doorman manager of the uh, uh, Bowery Bank, which is today the uh, Capitale, which is an event space. Um, another bank uh, that's uh, quite well known and a New York City landmark is uh, 
the uh, what was actually the third Germania Bank building. There were uh, three Germania Bank buildings on the Bowery. Uh, the second one is at 215 Bowery, and there's a piece that we did about that building. But the famous one is, of course, 190 Bowery, which after it stopped being a bank, uh, it was uh, a home for artists including Roy Lichtenstein and uh, who lived there for many decades. Uh, he's a photographer. He had his studio there as well as he taught photography classes. And uh, when the building uh, finally sold uh, for 55 million, just uh, about three or four years ago, uh, that sale is credited as the uh, largest private real estate deal in New York City history. Another bank uh, that's also a New York City landmark is the uh, Bowery Lane Theater Building, which was uh, a uh, Germania bank at, at one time. And then later, it became home to a series of theaters, including the Jean Cocteau Repertory Company. Uh, and it's where Bernadette Peters uh, made uh, her uh, premier uh, performances in New York City. And it's also where the last uh, play of Tennessee Williams was performed while he was still alive. Um, another piece uh, in the book, uh, and poster is about Robert Frank, who lived at 184 Bowery, a uh, great photographer. Uh, and a lot of amazing things happened uh, in the building as well. John uh, Lennon and Yoko Ono shot a movie there. Another photographer on the Bowery, photographer Berenice Abbott, uh, who was coming back from Europe the depression had hit and she wanted to get a job with the Works Progress Administration. And uh, the official asked her what she would like to photograph. And she said, I'd like to photograph the Bowery. And the official said, oh, well, nice girls don't go to the Bowery. And she said, I'm not a nice girl, I'm a photographer. And she did photograph the Bowery and uh, her book, Changing New York is, uh, one of the most compelling uh, uh, photographic studies of the city uh, from her time. Um, this is a piece about uh, the history of uh, flop houses in New York City. And of course, uh, still with us, uh, going strong is the Bowery Mission. Um, which has helped millions of hungry and homeless men in the city. Uh, the documentary classic, there's, there's basically two movies that uh, I highly recommend anybody that's remotely interested in the Bowery uh, seek out. One is the 1956 documentary by Lionel Rogozin which was partly shot at the Bowery Mission and on the street. And it's, it, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, it was one of the first documentaries uh, listed on the Library of Congress's uh, National Treasures list. Um, right next door to the Bowery Mission, uh, and the Bowery Mission uh, is these two buildings here, 127 uh, and 129 Bowery. This building, the Salvation Army uh, uh, Memorial Hotel building, uh, for a long time, it was the tallest building on the Bowery. And the daughter of the founder of the Salvation Army, uh, Ava Booth, uh, worked here uh, and officiated uh, on the Salvation Army in America uh, for a very long time. And uh, this may seem like it has nothing to do with what we're talking about here, but uh, Mae West, when she was a young girl, had loved going to the Bowery with her mother. And she just 
she thought things were so raucous and wild and she just loved the licentious feeling that she got uh, on the Bowery. And uh, when in, in early Hollywood, when she was uh, uh, making her, her film debut, feature film debut, uh, she uh, made, she done them wrong. And uh, she had done research on the Bowery and she said in an interview that she was passing the Salvation Army Hotel and she saw this Salvation Army worker come out and she said he was the most handsome guy she'd ever seen. And that's where she got the idea to have her Diamond Lil character fall in love with uh, a, a Salvation Army worker played by Cary Grant. And she, of course, delivers the most famous seduction line in screen history, come up and see me sometime. Um, a piece in the book uh, that uh, Eric Ferrara wrote uh, about Sammy's Bowery Follies, where the high life meets the low life. Uh, Sammy Fuchs uh, had this bar on the Bowery and he got the idea uh, in the ninth early 1940s that uh, he hire uh, some former vaudevillians uh, and have them perform in his club for a modest fee and that it might attract uh, people to come to his uh, to his bar restaurant and uh, what was unusual is he did not raise the prices on a lot of the liquors so that he continued to get the Bowery winos as well as some of the glitterati that would come to Sammy's Bowery Follies for the show. Uh, and a lot of famous people uh, uh, came to Sammy's Bowery Follies. The first community garden, Liz Christie Garden, uh, corner of Houston and Bowery. Just behind uh, Bowery, uh, between 2nd Street and 3rd Street is the New York Marble Cemetery, one of the oldest cemeteries in the city. Uh, the Bowery was home to uh, uh, and inspiration to a lot of the great figures of uh, the Beat Generation. Um, five Cooper Square at one time, was the five spot uh, jazz club. And this is where Billie Holiday gave some of her last performances. It's also considered the birthplace of improvisational jazz, which was popularized by Ornette Coleman. Twenty seven Cooper Square is where a uh, Bunch of really fascinating uh, beat generation uh, writers, and uh, uh, there was painter Elizabeth Murray, uh, the jazz saxophonist Archie Shep uh, lived, and this is one of the key places for the emergence of the Black Arts Movement, uh, which happened in the 1960s. CBGB a uh, birthplace of punk rock uh, was founded by Hilly Crystal and uh, sadly the uh, the club closed and uh, uh, a great thanks to uh, David Godless, Bob Bruin and Stephanie Chernikowski who very generously allowed us to use photographs. A uh, site on the Bowery that uh, we did not get into the book, uh, but if indeed we're able to do a revision, would love to add it, uh, is 266 Bowery, uh, which was home to uh, uh, Debbie Harry and Blondie. The entire uh, group lived in the building. Um, and are there any questions?
I apologize for uh, uh, the PowerPoint, uh, which I had to try to put together based on the book as well as a previous PowerPoint that I had used. Um, if anybody is interested in the book, it's available by going to BoweryAlliance.org. And we do not uh, uh, add any kind of profit to the book. We sell it for what, uh, for what we pay for it. There is a shipping cost, but... Um, um. Thank you. That was great. We have one question to someone asking if this is being recorded. It is being recorded. It will be up on our YouTube channel along with all of our other preservation schools. Um, this was great. It was a, a much different version of preservation school kind of showing the alternate ways to do architectural preservation, really the, you know, not just the straight hoping to get everything landmarked, but obviously that is always the goal. But, you know, when you can't get everything, having it be recorded and uh, being able to display it and share the information with people so that if things are lost, we still have that history recorded. And uh, we have the book in the office, so I have seen the physical copy. It is great. It is very beautiful. I highly encourage if you are able to, to pick up a copy. Um, and yeah, if there are any other questions, please. Uh, we're not that many people, so you can unmute yourself if you like, or you can write them in the chat. Well, I'm not seeing any. Um, let me see what this is. No, no questions? Oh, yes, Michelle? Hi, I wanted to add that um, the Bowery is also the scene of every form of architectural um, building for decades. There's, there's a representative of each architectural form on the about well there used to be i don't know if there still is everything there but it and it is on um this historic register for cultural as well as historic as architectural reasons so that's why it's not just limited to the buildings as you as david was presenting <laughs> my input to yeah. Also, uh, I, you know, if I was just winging it, uh, sometimes you, when you're doing a PowerPoint, you get tied to whatever slides you have in front of you. But uh, the community has really been demoralized uh, in the past few years by uh, a upzoning of Soho NoHo, uh, which was pushed through by compliant elected officials and uh, is going to uh, raise heights and and bulk on the on uh, the buildings in Soho, NoHo and Chinatown. Uh, and it's having a, a tremendously negative impact on longtime uh, residents, uh, including the artist uh, live work spaces and small businesses. And at almost the same time, the Soho NoHo um, bill went through City Hall and was approved. Um, 
the mayor also carried out the chainsaw massacre of the East River Park, uh, which is just beyond anything I've ever seen in the city's history, even a stop work order you know, from one of the high courts in the city did not stop this mayor from needlessly tearing down trees in, instead of pursuing a, uh, a, a way to do flood control that would not necessitate the complete destruction of thousands of uh, trees, many of them very, very old. Um, and the Elizabeth Street Garden is, is another, uh, you know, near the Bowery cause that's uh, very close to all our hearts. Um, that's the largest green space in that community. And, uh, you know, there are forces still trying to tear it down uh, to build housing that could be built elsewhere. We got an amen from Karen Spencer on that one. And, and the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors, my understanding, whoops, the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors is actively pursuing uh, landmarking of several buildings, despite the administration's dislike for landmarking and the fact that developers rule New York. Just wanted to add that one. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. We're, we're also one of many communities that uh, is still reeling from another effort to uh, basically sidewalks and uh, streets for these outdoor sheds, making them permanent. Uh, we, you know, all support emergency efforts to help uh, our our businesses, especially small businesses. But uh, this uh, um, effort to try to make it permanent, a permanent takeover of our sidewalks and our streets, is something that uh, is just beyond anything. I would have ever imagined. Um, I think the community is really demoralized on so many fronts right now that uh, it's uh, it's really difficult to to know how to take care of uh, everything. Any other questions? Well, I'd like to leave it off on a positive note, but I guess not. <laughs> Don't see any other questions. Uh, so I guess we will end it there. Um, just reminder, as I said in the beginning, we have other preservation schools scheduled. You can find them on our website, hdc.org. Uh, thank you very much for this, David. It was a great presentation. Um, as I said, the book is great. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And hopefully I will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, HDC. Uh, if you visit our website, uh, 
uh, BoweryAlliance.org. Uh, you can find out about getting a copy of it. Um, our contact information is there as well. Uh, if anybody would like to get involved in any way, we uh, would love that. Um, most of our active members are over uh, 45. Um, and uh, definitely, uh, you know, there's so much going on. Um, and uh, we thank you very much. Right, so check out their website. And if anyone needs any information, again, feel free to email HDC as well. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you.